Section thirty three of Germanal by Emile Zola. Translation by Havelock Ellis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Berard. Part six. Chapter four. When they came out of Rasseneur's, Etienne and Catherine walked on in silence. The thaw was beginning, a slow, cold thaw, which stained the snow without melting it. In the livid sky, a full moon could be faintly seen behind great clouds, black rags driven furiously by a tempestuous wind far above, and on the earth no breath was stirring, nothing could be heard but drippings from the roofs, the falling of white lumps with a soft thud etienne was embarrassed by this woman who had been given to him and in his disquiet he could find nothing to say the idea of taking her with him to hide at Requillard seemed absurd he had proposed to lead her back to the settlement to her parents house but she had refused in terror no no anything rather than be a burden on them once more after having behaved so badly to them and neither of them spoke any more they tramped on at random through the roads which were becoming rivers of mud at first they went down toward the Voreux. then they turned to the right and passed between the pit bank and the canal but you'll have to sleep somewhere he said at last now if i only had a room i could easily take you but a curious spasm of timidity interrupted him the past came back to him their old longings for each other and the delicacies and the shames which had prevented them from coming together did he still desire her that he felt so troubled gradually warmed at the heart by a fresh longing the recollection of the blows she had dealt him at gaston marie now attracted him instead of filling him with spite and he was surprised the idea of taking her to Recuillard was becoming quite natural and easy to execute now come decide where would you like me to take you you must hate me very much to refuse to come with me she was following him slowly delayed by the painful slipping of her sabots into the ruts and without raising her head she murmured i have enough trouble good god don't give me any more what good would it do us what you ask now that i have a lover and you have a woman yourself she meant moquette she believed that he still went with this girl as the rumour ran for the last fortnight and when he swore to her that it was not so she shook her head for she remembered the evening when she had seen them eagerly kissing each other isn't it a pity all this nonsense he whispered stopping we might understand each other so well she shuddered slightly and replied never mind you've nothing to be sorry for you don't lose much if you knew what a trumpery thing i am no bigger than two haporth of butter so ill made that i shall never become a woman sure enough and she went on freely accusing herself as though the long delay of her puberty had been her own fault in spite of the man whom she had had this lessened her placed her among the urchins one has some excuse at any rate when one can produce a child my poor little one said etienne with deep pity and a very low voice they were at the foot of the pit bank hidden in the shadow of the enormous pile an inky cloud was just then passing over the moon they could no longer even distinguish their faces their breaths were mingled their lips were seeking each other for that kiss which had tormented them with desire for months but suddenly the moon reappeared and they saw the sentinel above them at the top of the rocks white with light standing out erect on the barreau and before they had kissed an emotion of modesty separated them that old modesty in which there was something of anger of vague repugnance and much friendship they set out again heavily up to their ankles in mud then it's settled you don't want to have anything to do with me asked etienne no she said you after cheval and after you another eh no 
that disgusts me it doesn't give me any pleasure what's the use of doing it they were silent and walked some hundred paces without exchanging a word but anyhow do you know where to go to he said again i can't leave you out in a night like this she replied simply i'm going back chaval is my man i have nowhere else to sleep but with him but he will beat you to death there was silence again she had shrugged her shoulders in resignation he would beat her and when he was tired of beating her he would stop was not that better than to roam the streets like a vagabond then she was used to blows she said to console herself that eight out of ten girls were no better off than she was if her lover married her some day it would all the same be very nice of him etienne and catherine were moving mechanically towards montsou and as they came near their silences grew longer it was as though they had never before been together he could find no argument to convince her in spite of the deep vexation which he felt at seeing her go back to cheval his heart was breaking he had nothing better to offer than an existence of wretchedness and flight a night with no to-morrow should a soldier's bullet go through his head perhaps after all it was wiser to suffer what he was suffering rather than risk a fresh suffering so he led her back to her lovers with sunken head and made no protest when she stopped him on the main road at the corner of the yards twenty metres from the estaminet piquette saying don't come any farther if he sees you it will only make things worse eleven o'clock struck at the church the estaminet was closed but gleams came through the cracks good-bye she murmured she had given him her hand he kept it and she had to draw it away painfully with a slow effort to leave him without turning her head she went in through the little latched door but he did not turn away standing at the same place with his eyes on the house anxious as to what was passing within he listened trembling lest he should hear the cries of a beaten woman the house remained black and silent he only saw a light appear at a first-floor window and as this window opened and he recognized the thin shadow that was leaning over the road he came near catherine then whispered very low he's not come back i'm going to bed please go away etienne went off the thaw was increasing a regular shower was falling from the roofs a moist sweat blowed down the walls the palings the whole confused mass of this industrial district lost in night at first he turned towards Requillard, sick with fatigue and sadness having no other desire except to disappear under the earth and to be annihilated there then the idea of the Varro occurred to him again he thought of the belgian workmen who were going down of his mates at the settlement exasperated against the soldiers and resolved not to tolerate strangers in their pit and he passed again along the canal through the puddles of melted snow as he stood once more near the pit bank the moon was shining brightly he raised his eyes and gazed at the sky the clouds were galloping by whipped on by the strong wind which was blowing up there but they were growing white and ravelling out thinly with the misty transparency of troubled water over the moon's face they succeeded each other so rapidly that the moon veiled at moments constantly reappeared in limpid clearness with gaze full of his pure brightness etienne was lowering his head when a spectacle on the summit of the pit bank attracted his attention the sentinel stiffened by cold was walking up and down taking twenty-five paces towards marchand's and then returning towards monceau the white glitter of his bayonet could be seen above his black silhouette which stood out clearly against the pale sky but what interested the young man behind the cabin where bonnemort used to take shelter on tempestuous nights was a moving shadow a crouching beast in ambush which he immediately recognized as jeanlin with his long flexible spine like a martin's the sentinel could not see him 
that brigand of a child was certainly preparing some practical joke for he was still furious against the soldiers and asking when they were going to be freed from these murderers who had been sent here with guns to kill people for a moment etienne thought of calling him to prevent the execution of some stupid trick the moon was hidden he had seen him draw himself up ready to spring but the moon reappeared and the child remained crouching at every turn the sentinel came as far as the cabin then turned his back and walked in the opposite direction and suddenly as a cloud threw its shadow jeanlin leapt on to the soldier's shoulders with the great bound of a wild cat and gripping him with his claws buried his large open knife in his throat the horsehair collar resisted he had to apply both hands to the handle and hang on with all the weight of his body he had often bled fowls which he had found behind farms it was so rapid that there was only a stifled cry in the night while the musket fell with the sound of an old iron already the moon was shining again motionless with stupor etienne was still gazing a shout had been choked in his chest above the pit bank was vacant no shadow was any longer visible against the wild flight of clouds he ran up and found jeanlin on all fours before the corpse which was lying back with extended arms beneath the limpid light the red trousers and grey overcoat contrasted harshly with the snow not a drop of blood had flowed the knife was still in the throat up to the handle with a furious unreasoning blow of the fist he knocked the child down beside the body what have you done that for he stammered wildly jeanlin picked himself up and rested on his hands with a feline movement of his thin spine his large ears his green eyes his prominent jaws were quivering and aflame with the shock of his deadly blow by god why have you done this i don't know i wanted to he persisted in this reply for three days he had wanted to it tormented him it made his head ache behind his ears because he thought about it so much need one be so particular with these damned soldiers who were worrying the colliers in their own homes of the violent speeches he had heard in the forest the cries of destruction and death shouted among the pits five or six words had remained with him and these he repeated like a street urchin playing at revolution and he knew no more no one had urged him on it had come to him of itself just as the desire to steal onions from a field came to him startled at this obscure growth of crime in the recesses of this childish brain etienne again pushed him away with a kick like an unconscious animal he trembled lest the guard at the voreux had heard the sentinel's stifled cry and looked towards the pit every time the moon was uncovered but nothing stirred and he bent down felt the hands that were gradually becoming icy and listened to the heart which had stopped beneath the overcoat only the bone handle of the knife could be seen with a motto on it the simple word amour engraved in black letters his eyes went from the throat to the face suddenly he recognized the little soldier it was jules the recruit with whom he had talked one morning and deep pity came over him in front of this fair gentle face marked with freckles the blue eyes wide open were gazing at the sky with that fixed gaze with which he had before seen him searching the horizon for the country of his birth where was it that plogon which had appeared to him beneath the dazzling sun over there over there the sea was moaning afar on this tempestuous night that wind passing above had perhaps swept over the moors two women perhaps were standing there the mother and the sister clutching their wind-blown coifs gazing as if they could see what was now happening to the little fellow through the leagues which separated them they would always wait for him now what an abominable thing it is for poor devils to kill each other for the sake of the rich but this corpse had to be disposed of etienne at first thought of throwing it into the canal but was deterred from this by the certainty that it would be found there 
his anxiety became extreme every minute was of importance what decision should he take he had a sudden inspiration if he could carry the body as far as Recolard, he would be able to bury it there for ever come here he said to jeanlin the child was suspicious no you want to beat me and then i have business good night in fact he had given a rendezvous to bebert and lydie in a hiding-place a hole arranged under the wood supply at the bureau it had been arranged to sleep out so as to be there if the belgians bones were to be broken by stoning when they went down the pit listen repeated etienne come here or i shall call the soldiers who will cut your head off and as jeanlin was making up his mind he rolled his handkerchief and bound the soldier's neck tightly without drawing out the knife so as to prevent the blood from flowing the snow was melting on the soil there was neither a red patch nor the footmarks of a struggle take the legs jeanlin took the legs while etienne seized the shoulders after having fastened the gun behind his back and then they both slowly descended the pit bank trying to avoid rolling any rocks down fortunately the moon was hidden but as they passed along the canal it reappeared brightly and it was a miracle that the guard did not see them silently they hastened on hindered by the swinging of the corpse and obliged to place it on the ground every hundred metres at the corner of the Recrelar lane they heard a sound which froze them with terror and they only had time to hide behind a wall to avoid a patrol farther on a man came across them but he was drunk and moved away abusing them at last they reached the old pit bathed in perspiration and so exhausted that their teeth were chattering etienne had guessed that it would not be easy to get the soldier down the ladder shaft it was an awful task first of all jeanlin standing above had to let the body slide down while etienne hanging on to the bushes had to accompany it to enable it to pass the first two ladders where the rungs were broken afterwards at every ladder he had to perform the same manoeuvre over again going down first then receiving the body in his arms and he had thus down thirty ladders two hundred and ten metres to feel it constantly falling over him the gun scraped his spine he had not allowed the child to go for the candle end which she preserved avariciously what was the use the light would only embarrass them in this narrow tube when they arrived at the pit eye however out of breath he sent the youngster for the candle he then sat down and waited for him in the darkness near the body with heart beating violently as soon as jeanlin reappeared with the light etienne consulted with him for the child had explored these old workings even to the cracks through which men could not pass they set out again dragging the dead body for nearly a kilometre through a maze of ruinous galleries at last the roof became low and they found themselves kneeling beneath a sandy rock supported by half-broken planks it was a sort of long chest in which they laid the little soldier as in a coffin they placed his gun by his side then with vigorous blows of their heels they broke the timber at the risk of being buried themselves immediately the rock gave way and they scarcely had time to crawl back on their elbows and knees when etienne returned seized by the desire to look once more the roof was still falling in slowly crushing the body beneath its enormous weight and then there was nothing more left nothing but the vast mass of the earth jeanlin having returned to his own corner his little cavern of villainy was stretching himself out on the hay overcome by weariness and murmuring hey ho the brats must wait for me i'm going to have an hour's sleep etienne had blown out the candle of which there was only a small end left he also was worn out but he was not sleepy painful nightmare thoughts were beating like hammers in his skull only one at last remained torturing him and fatiguing him with a question to which he could not reply why had he not struck cheval when he held him beneath the knife and why had this child just killed a soldier whose very name he did not know 
it shook his revolutionary beliefs the courage to kill the right to kill was he then a coward in the hay the child had begun snoring the snoring of a drunken man as if he were sleeping off the intoxication of his murder etienne was disgusted and irritated it hurt him to know that the boy was there and to hear him suddenly he started a breath of fear passed over his face a light rustling a sob seemed to him to have come out of the depths of the earth the image of the little soldier lying over there with his gun beneath the rocks froze his back and made his hair stand up it was idiotic the whole mind seemed to be filled with voices he had to light the candle again and only grew calm on seeing the emptiness of the galleries by this pale light for another quarter of an hour he reflected still absorbed in the same struggle his eyes fixed on the burning wick but there was a spluttering the wick was going out and everything fell back into darkness he shuddered again he could have boxed jeanlin's ears to keep him from snoring so loudly the neighbourhood of the child became so unbearable that he escaped tormented by the need for fresh air hastening through the galleries and up the passage as though he could hear a shadow panting at his heels up above in the midst of the ruins of Requillard, etienne was at last able to breathe freely since he dared not kill it was for him to die and this idea of death which had already touched him came again and fixed itself in his head as a last hope to die bravely to die for the revolution that would end everything would settle his account good or bad and prevent him from thinking more if the men attacked the borangs he would be in the first rank and would have a good chance of getting a bad blow it was with firmer step that he returned to prowl around the barrow two o'clock struck and the loud noise of voices was coming from the captain's room where the guards who watched over the pit were posted the disappearance of the sentinel had overcome the guards with surprise they had gone to arouse the captain and after a careful examination of the place they concluded that it must be a case of desertion hiding in the shade etienne recollected this republican captain of whom the little soldier had spoken who knows if he might not be persuaded to pass over to the people's side the troop would raise their rifles and that would be the signal for a massacre of the bourgeois a new dream took possession of him he thought no more of dying but remained for hours with his feet in the mud and a drizzle from the thaw falling on his shoulders filled by the feverish hope that victory was still possible up to five o'clock he watched for the barans then he perceived that the company had cunningly arranged that they should sleep at the barreau the descent had begun and the few strikers from the du saint quarant settlement who had been posted as scouts had not yet warned their mates it was he who told them of the trick and they set out running while he waited behind the pit bank on the towing path six o'clock struck and the earthy sky was growing pale and lighting up with a reddish dawn when the abbe ranvier came along the path holding up his cassock above his thin legs every monday he went to say an early mass at a convent chapel on the other side of the pit good morning my friend he shouted in a loud voice after staring at the young man with his flaming eyes but at the end did not reply far away between the rural platforms he had just seen a woman pass and he rushed forward anxiously for he thought he recognized catherine since midnight catherine had been walking about the thawing roads chaval on coming back and finding her in bed had knocked her out with a blow he shouted to her to go at once by the door if she did not wish to go by the window and scarcely dressed in tears and bruised by kicks in her legs she had been obliged to go down pushed outside by a final thrust this sudden separation dazed her and she sat down on a stone looking up at the house still expecting that he would call her back it was not possible he would surely look for her and tell her to come back when he saw her thus shivering and abandoned with no one to take her in at the end of two hours she made up her mind dying of cold and as motionless as a dog thrown into the street she left montsou then retraced her steps 
but dared neither to call from the pathway nor to knock at the door at last she went off by the main road to the right with the idea of going to the settlement to her parents house but when she reached it she was seized by such shame that she rushed away along the gardens for fear of being recognized by someone in spite of the heavy sleep which weighed on all eyes behind the closed shutters and after that she wandered about frightened at the slightest noise trembling lest she should be seized and led away as a strumpet to that house at marsh end the threat of which had haunted her like nightmare for months twice she stumbled against the barreau but terrified at the loud voices of the guard she ran away out of breath looking behind her to see if she was being pursued the Requillard lane was always full of drunken men she went back to it however with the vague hope of meeting there him she had repelled a few hours earlier chaval had to go down that morning and this thought brought catherine again towards the pit though she felt that it would be useless to speak to him all was over between them there was no work going on at jean bart and he had sworn to kill her if she worked again at the Voreau, where he feared that she would compromise him so what was to be done to go elsewhere to die of hunger to yield beneath the blows of every man who might pass she dragged herself along tottering amid the ruts with aching legs and mud up to her spine the thaw had now filled the streets with a flood of mire she waded through it still walking not daring to look for a stone to sit on day appeared catherine had just recognized the back of cheval who was cautiously going round the pit-bank when she noticed lydie and bever putting their noses out of their hiding-place beneath the wood supply they had passed the night there in ambush without going home since jeanlin's order was to await him and while this latter was sleeping off the drunkenness of his murder at Requillard, the two children were lying in each other's arms to keep warm the wind blew between the planks of chestnut and oak and they rolled themselves up as in some woodcutter's abandoned hut lydie did not dare to speak aloud the sufferings of the small beaten woman any more than bebert found courage to complain of the captain's blows which made his cheeks swell but the captain was really abusing his power risking their bones in mad marauding expeditions while refusing to share the booty their hearts rose in revolt and they had at last embraced each other in spite of his orders careless of that box of the ears from the invisible with which he had threatened them it never came so they went on kissing each other softly with no idea of anything else putting into that caress the passion they had long struggled against the whole of their martyred and tender natures all night through they had thus kept each other warm so happy at the bottom of the secret hole that they could not remember that they had ever been so happy before not even on st barbara's day when they had eaten fritters and drunk wine the sudden sound of a bugle made catherine start she raised herself and saw the baroque guards taking up their arms etienne arrived running bebert and lydie jumped out of their hiding-place with a leap and over there beneath the growing daylight a band of men and women were coming from the settlement gesticulating wildly with anger End of section thirty three section thirty four of germanon by emile zola translated by havelock ellis the slipper box recording is in the public domain reading by matt Perard. part six chapter five all the entrances to the Voreux had been closed and the sixty soldiers with grounded arms were barring the only door left free that leading to the receiving room by his narrow staircase into which opened the captain's room and the shed the men had been drawn up in two lines against the brick wall so that they could not be attacked from behind at first the band of miners from the settlement kept at a distance they were some thirty at most and talked together in a violent and confused way 
maheude who had arrived first with dishevelled hair beneath a handkerchief nodded on in haste and having estelle asleep in her arms repeated in feverish tones don't let any one in or any one out shut them all in there maheu approved and just then father monk arrived with Requillard. they wanted to prevent him from passing but he protested he said that his horses ate their hay all the same and cared precious little about a revolution besides there was a horse dead and they were waiting for him to draw it up etienne freed the old groom and the soldiers allowed him to go to the shaft a quarter of an hour later as the band of strikers which had gradually enlarged was becoming threatening a large door opened on the ground floor and some men appeared drawing out the dead beast a miserable mass of flesh still fastened in the rope net they left it in the midst of the puddles of melting snow the surprise was so great that no one prevented the men from returning and barricading the door afresh they all recognized the horse with his head bent back and stiff against the plank whispers ran around it's trompette isn't it it's trompette it was in fact trompette since his descent he had never become acclimatized he remained melancholy with no taste for his task as though tortured by regret for the light in vain Bataille, the doyen of the mine would rub him with his ribs in his friendly way softly biting his neck to impart to him a little of the resignation gained in his ten years beneath the earth these caresses increased his melancholy his skin quivered beneath the confidences of the comrade who had grown old in darkness and both of them whenever they met and snorted together seemed to be grieving the old one that he could no longer remember the young one that he could not forget at the stable they were neighbors at the manger and lived with lowered heads breathing in each other's nostrils exchanging a constant dream of daylight visions of green grass of white roads of infinite yellow light then when trompette bathed in sweat lay in agony in his litter Batel had smelled at him despairingly with short snips like sobs he felt that he was growing cold the mind was taking from him his last joy that friend fallen from above fresh with good odours who recalled to him his youth in the open air and he had broken his tether neighing with fear when he perceived that the other no longer stirred moke had indeed warned the head captain a week ago but much they troubled about a sick horse at such time as this these gentlemen did not at all like moving the horses now however they had to make up their minds to take him out the evening before the groom had spent an hour with two men tying up trompette they harnessed a tail to bring him to the shaft the old horse slowly pulled dragging his dead comrade through so narrow a gallery that he could only shake himself at the risk of taking the skin off and he tossed his head listening to the grazing sound of the carcass as it went to the knacker's yard at the pit eye when he was unharnessed he followed with his melancholy eye the preparations for the ascent the body pushed on to the crossbars over the sump the net fastened beneath a cage at last the porters rang meat he lifted his neck to see it go up at first softly then at once lost in the darkness flown up forever to the top of that black hole and he remained with neck stretched out his vague beast's memory perhaps recalling the things of the earth but it was all over he would never see his comrade again and he himself would thus be tied up in a pitiful bundle on the day when he would ascend up there his legs began to tremble the fresh air which came from the distant country choked him and he seemed intoxicated when he went heavily back to the stable at the surface the colliers stood gloomily before trompette's carcass a woman said in a low voice another man that may go down if it likes but a new flood arrived from the settlement and levaque who was at the head followed by his wife and bouteloup shouted kill them those barains no black legs here kill them kill them all rushed forward and etienne had to stop them 
he went up to the captain a tall thin young man of scarcely twenty-eight years with a despairing resolute face he explained things to him he tried to win him over watching the effect of his words what was the good of risking a useless massacre was not justice on the side of the miners they were all brothers and they ought to understand one another when he came to use the word republic the captain made a nervous movement but he preserved his military stiffness and said suddenly keep off do not force me to do my duty three times over etienne tried again behind him his mates were growling the report ran that m hennebeau was at the pit and they talked of letting him down by the neck to see if he would hew his coal himself but it was a false report only négrel and dansart were there they both showed themselves for a moment at a window of the receiving-room the head captain stood in the background rather out of countenance since his adventure with Piron, while the engineer bravely looked around on the crowd with his bright little eyes smiling with that sneering contempt in which he enveloped men and things generally hooting arose and they disappeared and in their place only souverain's pale face was seen he was just then on duty he had not left his engine for a single day since the strike began no longer talking more and more absorbed by a fixed idea which seemed to be shining like steel in the depths of his pale eyes repeated the captain loudly i wish to hear nothing my orders are to guard the pit and i shall guard it and do not press on to me my men or i shall know how to drive you back in spite of his firm voice he was growing pale with increasing anxiety as the flood of miners continued to swell he would be relieved at midday but fearing that he would not be able to hold out until then he had sent a trammer from the pit to montsou to ask for reinforcements shouts had replied to him kill the blacklegs kill the barangs we mean to be masters in our own place etienne drew back in despair the end had come there was nothing more except to fight and to die and he ceased to hold back his mates the mob moved up to the little troop there were nearly four hundred of them and the people from the neighboring settlements were all running up they all shouted the same cry maheu and levaque said furiously to the soldiers get off with you we have nothing against you get off with you this doesn't concern you said maheude let us attend to our own affairs and from behind the levaque woman added more violently must we eat you to get through just clear out of the bloody place even Lydie's shrill voice was heard she had crammed herself in more closely with bebert and was saying in a high voice oh the pale-livered pigs catherine a few paces off was gazing and listening stupefied by new scenes of violence into the midst of which ill luck seemed to be always throwing her had she not suffered too much already what fault had she committed then that misfortune would never give her any rest the day before she had understood nothing of the fury of the strike she thought that when one has one share of blows it is useless to go and seek for more and now her heart was swelling with hatred she remembered what etienne had often told her when they used to sit up she tried to hear what he was now saying to the soldiers he was treating them as mates he reminded them that they also belonged to the people and that they ought to be on the side of the people against those who took advantage of their wretchedness but a tremor ran through the crowd and an old woman rushed up it was mother brule terrible in her leanness with her neck and arms in the air coming up at such a pace that the wisps of her gray hair blinded her ah by god here i am she stammered out of breath that traitor perron who shut me up in the cellar and without waiting she fell on the soldiers her black mouth belching abuse pack of scoundrels dirty scum ready to lick their master's boots and only brave against poor people then the others joined her and there were volleys of insults a few indeed cried hurrah for the soldiers to the shaft with the officer but soon there was only one clamour down with the red breeches these men who had listened quietly with motionless mute faces to the fraternal appeals 
and the friendly attempts to win them over preserve the same stiff passivity beneath this hail of abuse behind them the captain had drawn his sword and as the crowd pressed in on them more and more threatening to crush them against the wall he ordered them to present bayonets they obeyed and a double row of steel points were placed in front of the strikers breasts ah the bloody swine yelled mother brulé drawing back but already they were coming on again in excited contempt of death the women were throwing themselves forward maheude and the levaque shouting kill us kill us then we want our rights levaque at the risk of getting cut had seized three bayonets in his hands shaking and pulling them in the effort to snatch them away he twisted them in the strength of his fury while bouteloup standing aside and annoyed at having followed his mate quietly watched him just come and look here said maheu just look a bit if you are good chaps and he opened his jacket and drew aside his shirt showing his naked breast with his hairy skin tattooed by coal he pressed on the bayonets compelling the soldiers to draw back terrible in his insolence and bravado one of them had pricked him in the chest and he became like a madman trying to make it enter deeper and to hear his ribs crack cowards you don't dare there are ten thousand behind us yes you can kill us there are ten thousand more of us to kill yet the position of the soldiers was becoming critical for they had received strict orders not to make use of their weapons until the last extremity and how were they to prevent these furious people from impaling themselves besides the space was getting less they were now pushed back against the wall and it was impossible to draw further back their little troop a mere handful of men opposed to the rising flood of miners still held its own however and calmly executed the brief orders given by the captain the latter with keen eyes and nervously compressed lips only feared lest they should be carried away by this abuse already a young sergeant a tall lean fellow whose thin moustache was bristling up was blinking his eyes in a disquieting manner near him an old soldier with tanned skin and stripes won in twenty campaigns and grown pale when he saw his bayonet twisted like a straw another doubtless a recruit still smelling the fields became very red every time he heard himself called scum and riff-raff and the violence did not cease the outstretched fists the abominable words the shovelfuls of accusations and threats which buffeted their faces it required all the force of order to keep them thus with mute faces in the proud gloomy silence of military discipline a collision seemed inevitable when captain richomme appeared from behind the troop with his benevolent white head overwhelmed by emotion he spoke out loudly by god this is idiotic such tomfoolery can't go on and he threw himself between the bayonets and the miners mates listen to me you know that i am an old workman and that i have always been one of you well by god i promise you that if they're not just with you i'm the man to go and say to the bosses how things lie but this is too much it does no good at all to howl bad names at these good fellows and try and get your bellies ripped up they listened hesitating but up above unfortunately little negrel's short profile reappeared he feared no doubt that he would be accused of sending a captain in place of venturing out himself and he tried to speak but his voice was lost in the midst of so frightful a tumult that he had to leave the window again simply shrugging his shoulders richomme then found it vain to entreat them in his own name and to repeat that the thing must be arranged between mates they repelled him suspecting him but he was obstinate and remained amongst them by god let them break my head as well as yours for i don't leave you while you are so foolish etienne whom he begged to help him in making them hear reason made a gesture of powerlessness it was too late there were now more than five hundred of them and besides the madmen who were rushing up to chase away the barains some came out of inquisitiveness or to joke and amuse themselves over the battle in the midst of one group at some distance 
zacharie and philomene were looking on as at a theatre so peacefully that they had brought their children achille and desiree another stream was arriving from Requillard, including moquet and moquette the farmer at once went on grinning to slap his friend zacharie on the back while moquette in a very excited condition rushed to the first rank of the evil disposed every minute however the captain looked down the montsou road the desired reinforcements had not arrived and his sixty men could hold out no longer at last it occurred to him to strike the imagination of the crowd and he ordered his men to load the soldiers executed the order but the disturbance increased the blustering and the mockery ah those shammers they're going off to the target jeered the women the brule the levaque and the others maheude with her breast covered by the little body of estelle who was awake and crying came so near that the sergeant asked her what she was going to do with that poor little brat what the devil's that to do with you she replied fire at it if you dare the men shook their heads with contempt none believed that they would fire on them there are no balls in their cartridges said levaque are we cossacks cried maheu you don't fire against frenchmen by god others said that when people had been through the crimean campaign they were not afraid of lead and all continued to thrust themselves on to the rifles if firing had begun at this moment the crowd would have been mown down in the front rank moquette was choking with fury thinking that the soldiers were going to gash the women's skins she had spat out all her coarse words at them and could find no vulgarity low enough when suddenly having nothing left but that mortal offence with which to bombard the faces of the troop she exhibited her backside with both hands she raised her skirts bent her back and expanded the enormous rotundity here that's for you and it's a lot too clean you dirty blackguards she ducked and butted so that each might have his share repeating after each thrust there's for the officer there's for the sergeant there's for the soldiers a tempest of laughter arose bebert and lydy were in convulsions etienne himself in spite of his sombre expectation applauded this insulting nudity all of them the banterers as well as the infuriated were now hooting the soldiers as though they had seen them stained by a splash of filth catherine only standing aside on some old timber remained silent with the blood at her heart slowly carried away by the hatred that was rising within her but a hustling took place to calm the excitement of his men the captain decided to make prisoners with a leap moquette escaped saving herself between the legs of her comrades three miners levaque and two others were seized among the more violent and kept in sight at the other end of the captain's room negrel and dansart above were shouting to the captain to come in and take refuge with them he refused he felt that these buildings with their doors without locks would be carried by assault and that he would undergo the shame of being disarmed his little troop was already growling with impatience it was impossible to flee before these wretches in sabots the sixty with their backs to the wall and their rifles loaded again faced the mob at first there was a recoil followed by deep silence the strikers were astonished at this energetic stroke then a cry arose calling for the prisoners demanding their immediate release some voices said that they were being murdered in there and without any attempt at concerted action carried away by the same impulse by the same desire for revenge they all ran to the piles of bricks which stood near those bricks for which the marly soil supplied the clay and which were baked on the spot the children brought them one by one and the women filled their skirts with them every one soon had her ammunition at her feet and the battle of stones began it was mother brule who sat up to first she broke the bricks on the sharp edge of her knee and with both hands she discharged the two fragments the levaque woman was almost putting her shoulders out being so large and soft that she had to come near to get her aim in spite of bottle-loops entreaties and he dragged her back in the hope of being able to lead her away now that her husband had been taken off 
they all grew excited and moquette tired of making herself bleed by breaking the bricks over her over thighs preferred to throw them whole even the youngsters came into line and bebert showed lydie how the brick ought to be sent from under the elbow it was a shower of enormous hailstones producing low thuds and suddenly in the midst of these furies catherine was observed with her fists in the air also brandishing half bricks and throwing them with all the force of her little arms she could not have said why she was suffocating she was dying of the desire to kill everybody would it not soon be done with this cursed life of misfortune she had had enough of it beaten and driven away by her man wandering about like a lost dog in the mud of the roads without being able to ask a crust from her father who was starving like herself things never seemed to get better they were getting worse ever since she could remember and she broke the bricks and threw them before her with the one idea of sweeping everything away her eyes so blinded that she could not even see whose jaws she might be crushing etienne who had remained in front of the soldiers nearly had his skull broken his ear was grazed and turning round he started when he realized that the brick had come from catherine's feverish hands but at the risk of being killed he remained where he was gazing at her many others also forgot themselves there absorbed in the battle with empty hands moquet criticized the blows as though he were looking on at a game of bouchon oh that was well struck and that other no luck he joked and with his elbow pushed zachary who was squabbling with philomene because he had boxed achilles and desiree's ears refusing to put them on his back so that they could see there were spectators crowded all along the road and at the top of the slope near the entrance to the settlement old bonnemort appeared resting on his stick motionless against the rust-coloured sky as soon as the first bricks were thrown captain richomme had again placed himself between the soldiers and the miners he was entreating the one party exhorting the other party careless of danger in such despair that large tears were flowing from his eyes it was impossible to hear his words in the midst of the tumult only his large gray moustache could be seen moving but the hail of bricks came faster the men were joining in following the example of the women then Mehud noticed that Mehu was standing behind the, with empty hands and somber air. "'What's up with you?' she shouted. "'Are you a coward? Are you going to let your mates be carried off to prison? Ah, if only I hadn't got this child, you should see!' Estelle, who was clinging to her neck, screaming, prevented her from joining Mother Brulé and the others, and as her man did not seem to hear, she kicked some bricks against his legs. "'By God, will you take that?' must i spit in your face before people to get your spirits up becoming very red he broke some bricks and threw them she lashed him on dazing him shouting behind him cries of death stifling her daughter against her breast with the spasm of her arms and he still moved forward until he was opposite the guns beneath the shower of stones the little troop was disappearing fortunately they struck too high and the wall was riddled what was to be done the idea of going in of turning their backs for a moment turned the captain's pale face purple but it was no longer possible they would be torn to pieces at the last movement a brick had just broken the peak of his cap drops of blood were running down his forehead several of his men were wounded and he felt that they were losing self-control in that unbridled instinct of self-defence when obedience to leaders ceases the sergeant had uttered a by god for his left shoulder had nearly been put out and his flesh bruised by a shock like the blow of a washerwoman's beetle against linen grazed twice over the recruit had his thumb smashed while his right knee was grazed were they to let themselves be worried much longer a stone having bounded back and struck the old soldier with the stripes beneath the belly his cheeks turned green and his weapon trembled as he stretched it out at the end of his lean arms three times the captain was on the point of ordering them to fire he was choked by anguish an endless struggle for several seconds set at odds in his mind all ideas and duties all his beliefs as a man 
and as a soldier the rain of bricks increased and he opened his mouth and was about to shout fire when the guns went off of themselves three shots at first then five then the roll of a volley then one by itself some time afterwards in the deep silence there was stupefaction on all sides they had fired and the gaping crowd stood motionless as yet unable to believe it but heart-rending cries arose while the bugle was sounded to cease firing and here was a mad panic the rush of cattle filled with grape-shot a wild flight through the mud bebert and lydie had fallen one on top of the other at the first three shots the little girl struck in the face the boy wounded beneath the left shoulder she was crushed and never stirred again but he moved seized her with both arms in the convulsions of his agony as if he wanted to take her again as he had taken her at the bottom of the black hiding-place where they had spent the past night and jeanlin who just then ran up from Requillart, still half asleep kicking about in the midst of the smoke saw him embrace his little wife and die the five other shots had brought down mother brule and captain brichon struck in the back as he was entreating his mates he had fallen on to his knees and slipping on to one hip he was groaning on the ground with eyes still full of tears the old woman whose breast had been opened had fallen back stiff and crackling like a bundle of dry faggots stammering one last oath in the gurgling of blood but then the volley swept the field mowing down the inquisitive groups who were laughing at the battle a hundred paces off a ball entered Mokay's mouth and threw him down with fractured skull at the feet of zacharie and philomene whose two youngsters were splashed with red drops at the same moment moquette received two balls in the belly she had seen the soldiers take aim and in an instinctive movement of her good nature she had thrown herself in front of catherine shouting out to her to take care she uttered a loud cry and fell on to her back overturned by the shock etienne ran up wishing to raise her and take her away but with a gesture she said it was all over then she groaned but without ceasing to smile at both of them as though she were glad to see them together now that she was going away all seemed to be over and the hurricane of balls was lost in the distance as far as the frontages of the settlement when the last shot isolated and delayed was fired maheu struck in the heart turned round and fell with his face down into a puddle black with coal maheude leant down in stupefaction eh hey, old man get up it's nothing is it her hands were engaged with estelle whom she had to put under one arm in order to turn her man's head say something where are you hurt his eyes were vacant and his mouth was slavered with bloody foam she understood he was dead then she remained seated in the mud with her daughter under her arm like a bundle gazing at her old man with a besotted air the pit was free with a nervous movement the captain had taken off and then put on his cap struck by a stone he preserved his pallid stiffness in face of the disaster of his life while his men with mute faces were reloading the frightened faces of negrel and dansart could be seen at the window of the receiving room souverain was behind them with a deep wrinkle on his forehead as though the nail of his fixed idea had printed itself there threateningly on the other side of the horizon at the edge of the plain von mort had not moved supported by one hand on his stick the other hand up to his brows to see better the murder of his people below the wounded were howling the dead were growing cold in twisted postures muddy with the liquid mud of the thaw here and there forming puddles among the inky patches of coal which reappeared beneath the tattered snow and in the midst of these human corpses all small poor and lean in their wretchedness lay trompette's carcass a monstrous and pitiful mass of dead flesh etienne had not been killed he was still waiting beside catherine who had fallen from fatigue and anguish when a sonorous voice made him start it was abbe ranvier who was coming back after saying mass and who with both arms in the air 
with the inspired fury of a prophet was calling the wrath of god down on the murderers he foretold the era of justice the approaching extermination of the middle class by fire from heaven since it was bringing its crimes to a climax by massacring the workers and the disinherited of the world End of section 34. Section 35 of Germanal by Emile Zola, translation by Havelock Ellis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. Part 7. Chapter 1. The shots fired at Monceau had reached as far as Paris with a formidable echo. For four days all the opposition journals had been indignant, displaying atrocious narratives on their front pages. Twenty-five wounded, fourteen dead, including three women and two children. And there were prisoners taken as well. Lavac had become a sort of hero, and was credited with a reply of antique sublimity to the examining magistrate the empire hit in mid-career by these few balls affected the calm of omnipotence without itself realizing the gravity of its wound it was simply an unfortunate collision something lost over there in the black country very far from the parisian boulevards which formed public opinion it would soon be forgotten the company had received official intimation to hush up the affair and to put an end to a strike which from its irritating duration was becoming a social danger so on wednesday morning three of the directors appeared at monceau the little town sick at heart which had not dared hitherto to rejoice over the massacre now breathed again and tasted the joy of being saved the weather too had become fine there was a bright sun one of those first february days which with their moist warmth tipped the lilac shoots with green all the shutters had been flung back at the administration building the vast structure seemed alive again and cheering rumours were circulating it was said that the directors deeply affected by the catastrophe had rushed down to open their paternal arms to the wanderers from the settlements now that the blow had fallen a more vigorous one doubtless than they had wished for they were prodigal in their task of relief and decreed measures that were excellent though tardy first of all they sent away the borangs and made much of this extreme concession to their workmen then they put an end to the military occupation of the pits which were no longer threatened by the crushed strikers they also obtained silence regarding the sentinel who had disappeared from the barreau the district had been searched without finding either the gun or the corpse and although there was a suspicion of crime it was decided to consider the soldier a deserter in every way they thus tried to attenuate matters trembling with fear for the morrow judging it dangerous to acknowledge the irresistible savagery of a crowd set free amid the falling structure of the old world and besides this work of conciliation did not prevent them from bringing purely administrative affairs to a satisfactory conclusion for denelin had been seen to return to the administration buildings where he met m hombeau the negotiations for the purchase of vandame continued and it was considered certain that denelin would accept the company's offers but what particularly stirred the country were the great yellow posters which the directors had stuck up in profusion on the walls on them were to be read these few lines in very large letters workers of monceau we do not wish that the errors of which you have lately seen the sad effects should deprive sensible and willing workmen of their livelihood we shall therefore reopen all the pits on monday morning and when work is resumed we shall examine with care and consideration those cases in which there may be room for improvement we shall in fact do all that is just or possible to do in one morning the ten thousand colliers passed before these placards not one of them spoke many shook their heads 
others went away with trailing steps without changing one line in their motionless faces up to now the settlement of the dauson quarant had persisted in its fierce resistance it seemed that the blood of their mates which had reddened the mud of the pit was barricading the road against the others scarcely a dozen had gone down merely perron and some sneaks of his sort whose departure and arrival were gloomily watched without a gesture or a threat therefore a deep suspicion greeted the placard stuck on to the church nothing was said about the return certificates in that would the company refuse to take them on again and the fear of retaliations the fraternal idea of protesting against the dismissal of the more compromised men made them all obstinate still it was dubious they would see they would return to the pit when these gentlemen were good enough to put things plainly silence crushed the low houses hunger itself seemed nothing all might die now that violent death had passed over their roofs but one house that of the Nihis, remained especially black and mute in its overwhelming grief since she had followed her man to the cemetery maheude kept her teeth clenched after the battle she had allowed etienne to bring back catherine muddy and half dead and as she was undressing her before the young man in order to put her to bed she thought for a moment that her daughter also had received a ball in the belly for the chemise was marked with large patches of blood but she soon understood that it was the flood of puberty which was at last breaking out in the shock of this abominable day ah another piece of luck that wound a fine present to be able to make children for the gendarmes to kill and she never spoke to catherine nor did she indeed talk to etienne the latter slept with jeanlin at the risk of being arrested seized by such horror at the idea of going back to the darkness of the regular that he would have preferred a prison a shudder shook him the horror of the night after all those deaths an unacknowledged fear of the little soldier who slept down there underneath the rocks besides he dreamed of the prison as of a refuge in the midst of the torment of his defeat but they did not trouble him and he dragged on his wretched hours not knowing how to weary out his body only at times maheude looked at both of them at him and her daughter with a spiteful air as though she were asking them what they were doing in her house once more they were all snoring in a heap father bonmorton occupied the former bed of the two youngsters who slept with catherine now that poor elzire no longer dug her hump into her big sister's ribs it was when going to bed that the mother felt the emptiness of the house by the coldness of her bed which was now too large in vain she took estelle to fill the vacancy that did not replace her man and she wept quietly for hours then the days began to pass by as before always without bread but without the luck to die outright things picked up here and there rendered to the wretches the poor service of keeping them alive nothing had changed in their existence only her man was gone on the afternoon of the fifth day etienne made miserable by the sight of this silent woman left the room and walked slowly along the paved street of the settlement the inaction which weighed on him impelled him to take constant walks with arms swinging idly and lowered head always tortured by the same thought he tramped thus for half an hour when he felt by an increase in his discomfort that his mates were coming to their doors to look at him his little remaining popularity had been driven to the winds by that fusillade and he never passed now without meeting fiery looks which pursued him when he raised his head there were threatening men there women drawing aside the curtains from their windows and beneath this still silent accusation and the restrained anger of these eyes enlarged by hunger and tears he became awkward and could scarcely walk straight these dumb reproaches seemed to be always increasing behind him he became so terrified lest he should hear the entire settlement come out to shout its wretchedness at him that he returned shuddering 
but at the Mahes the scene which met him still further agitated him old bonnemort was near the cold fireplace nailed to his chair ever since two neighbours on the day of the slaughter had found him on the ground with his stick broken struck down like an old thunder-stricken tree and while lenore and henri to beguile their hunger were scraping with deafening noise an old saucepan in which cabbages had been boiled the day before Mehude, after having placed estelle on the table was standing up threatening catherine with her fist say that again by god just dare to say that again catherine had declared her intention to go back to the Baroque. the idea of not gaining her bread of being thus tolerated in her mother's house like a useless animal that is in the way was becoming every day more unbearable and if it had not been for the fear of chaval she would have gone down on tuesday she said again stammering what would you have we can't go on doing nothing we should get bread anyhow maheude interrupted her listen to me the first one of you who goes to work i'll do for you no that would be too much to kill the father and go on taking it out of the children i've had enough of it i'd rather see you all put in your coffins like him that's gone already and her long silence broke out into a furious flood of words a fine sum catherine would bring her hardly thirty sous to which they might add twenty sous if the bosses were good enough to find work for that brigand john lynn fifty sous and seven mouths to feed the brats were only good to swallow soup as to the grandfather he must have broken something in his brain when he fell for he seemed imbecile unless it had turned his blood to see the soldiers firing at his mates that's it old man isn't it they've quite done for you it's no good having your hands still strong you're done for von mort looked at her with his dim eyes without understanding he remained for hours with fixed gaze having no intelligence now except to spit into a plate filled with ashes which was put beside him for cleanliness and they've not settled his pension either she went on and i'm sure they won't give it because of our ideas no i tell you that we've had too much to do with those people who bring ill luck but catherine ventured to say they promise on the placard just let me alone with your damned placard more bird lime for catching us and eating us they can be mighty kind now that they have ripped us open but where shall we go mother they won't keep us at the settlement sure enough maheude made a vague terrified gesture where should they go she did not know at all she avoided thinking it made her mad they would go elsewhere somewhere and as the noise of the saucepan was becoming unbearable she turned round on lenore and henri and boxed their ears the fall of estelle who had been crawling on all fours increased the disturbance the mother quieted her with a push a good thing if it had killed her she spoke of elzir she wished the others might have that child's luck then suddenly she burst out into loud sobs with her head against the wall etienne who was standing by did not dare to interfere he no longer counted for anything in the house and even the children drew back from him suspiciously but the unfortunate woman's tears went to his heart and he murmured come come courage we must try to get out of it she did not seem to hear him and was bemoaning herself now in a low continuous complaint ah the wretchedness is it possible things did go on before these horrors we ate our bread dry but we were all together and what has happened good god what have we done then that we should have such troubles some under the earth and the others with nothing left but too long to get there too it's true enough that they harnessed us like horses to work and it's not at all a just sharing of things to be always getting the stick and making rich people's fortunes bigger without hope of ever tasting the good things there's no pleasure in life when hope goes yes they couldn't have gone on longer we had to breathe a bit if we 
had only known is it possible to make oneself so wretched through wanting justice sighs swelled her breast and her voice choked with immense sadness then there are always some clever people there who promise you that everything can be arranged by just taking a little trouble then one loses one's head and one suffers so much from things as they are that one asks for things that can't be now i was dreaming like a fool i seemed to see a life of good friendship with everybody i went off into the air my faith into the clouds and then one breaks one's back when one tumbles down into the mud again it's not true there's nothing over there of the things that people tell of what there is is only wretchedness ah wretchedness as much as you like of it and bullets into the bargain etienne listened to this lamentation and every tear struck him with remorse he knew not what to say to calm maheude broken by her terrible fall from the heights of the ideal she had come back to the middle of the room and was now looking at him she addressed him with contemptuous familiarity in a last cry of rage and you do you talk of going back to the pit too after driving us out of the bloody place i've nothing to reproach you with but if i were in your shoes i should be dead of grief by now after causing such harm to the mates he was about to reply but then shrugged his shoulders in despair what was the good of explaining for she would not understand in her grief and he went away for he was suffering too much and resumed his wild walk outside there again he found the settlement apparently waiting for him the men at the doors the women at the windows as soon as he appeared growls were heard and the crowd increased the breath of gossip which had been swelling for four days was breaking out in a universal malediction fists were stretched towards him mothers spitefully pointed him out to their boys old men spat as they looked at him it was the change which follows on the morrow of defeat the fatal reverse of popularity an execration exasperated by all the suffering endured without result he had to pay for famine and death zacharie who came up with philomene hustled at the end as he went out grinning maliciously well he gets fat it's filling then to live on other people's deaths the levaque woman had already come to her door with bateloup she spoke of bebert her youngster killed by a bullet and cried yes there are cowards who get children murdered let him go and look for mine in the earth if he wants to give it me back she was forgetting her man in prison for the household was going on since bateloup remained but she thought of him however and went on in a shrill voice get along get along rascals may walk about while good people are put away and avoiding her etienne tumbled on to pierron who was running up across the gardens she had regarded her mother's death as a deliverance for the old woman's violence threatened to get them hanged nor did she weep over pierron's little girl that street-walker lady a good riddance but she joined in with her neighbors with the idea of getting reconciled with them and my mother eh and the little girl you were seen you were hiding yourself behind them when they cut the lead instead of you what was to be done strangle pierron and the others and fight the whole settlement at the end wanted to do so for a moment the blood was throbbing in his head he now looked upon his mates as brutes he was irritated to see them so unintelligent and barbarous that they wanted to revenge themselves on him for the logic of facts how stupid it all was and he felt disgust at his powerlessness to tame them again and satisfied himself with hastening his steps as though he were deaf to abuse soon it became a flight every house hooted him as he passed they hastened on his heels it was a whole nation cursing him with a voice that was becoming like thunder in its overwhelming hatred it was he the exploiter the murderer who was the sole cause of their misfortune he rushed out of the settlement pale and terrified with this yelling crowd behind his back when he at last reached the main road most of them left him but a few persisted until at the bottom of the slope 
before the advantage he met another group coming from the Baron. old moque and cheval were there since the death of his daughter moquette and of his son moquet the old man had continued to act as groom without a word of regret or complaint suddenly when he saw at the end he was shaken by fury tears broke out from his eyes and a flood of coarse words burst from his mouth black and bleeding from his habit of chewing tobacco you devil you bloody swine you filthy snout wait you've got to pay me for my poor children you'll have to come to it he picked up a brick broke it and threw both pieces yes yes clear him off shouted chaval who was grinning in excitement delighted at this vengeance everyone gets his turn now you're up against the wall you dirty hound and he also attacked etienne with stones a savage clamour arose they all took up bricks broke them and threw them to rip him open as they would like to have done to the soldiers he was dazed and could not flee he faced them trying to calm them with phrases his old speeches once so warmly received came back to his lips he repeated the words with which he had intoxicated them at the time when he could keep them in hand like a faithful flock but his power was dead and only stones replied to him he had just been struck on the left arm and was drawing back in great peril when he found himself hemmed in against the front of the advantage for the last few moments rasseneur had been at his door come in he said simply etienne hesitated it choked him to take refuge there come in then i'll speak to them he resigned himself and took refuge at the other end of the parlour while the innkeeper filled up the doorway with his broad shoulders look here my friends just be reasonable you know very well that i've never deceived you i've always been in favour of quietness and if you had listened to me you certainly wouldn't be where you are now rolling his shoulders and belly he went on at length allowing his facile eloquence to flow with a lulling gentleness of warm water and all his old success came back he regained his popularity naturally and without an effort as if he had never been hooted and called a coward a month before voices arose in approval very good we are with you that is the way to put it thundering applause broke out etienne in the background grew faint and there was bitterness at his heart he recalled rasseneur's prediction in the forest threatening him with the ingratitude of the mob what imbecile brutality what an abominable forgetfulness of old services it was a blind force which constantly devoured itself and beneath his anger at seeing these brutes spoil their own cause there was despair at his own fall and the tragic end of his ambition what was it already done for he remembered hearing beneath the beeches three thousand hearts beating to the echo of his own on that day he had held his popularity in both hands those people belonged to him he felt that he was their master mad dreams had then intoxicated him Monceau at his feet paris beyond becoming a deputy perhaps crushing the middle class in a speech the first speech ever pronounced by a workman in a parliament and it was all over he awakened miserable and detested his people were dismissing him by flinging bricks rasseneur's voice rose higher never will violence succeed the world can't be remade in a day those who have promised you to change it all at one stroke are either making fun of you or they are rascals bravo bravo shouted the crowd who then was the guilty one and this question which etienne put to himself overwhelmed him more than ever was it in fact his fault this misfortune which was making him bleed the wretchedness of some the murder of others these women these children lean and without bread he had had that lamentable vision one evening before the catastrophe but then a force was lifting him he was carried away with his mates besides he had never led them it was they who led him who obliged him to do things which he would never have done if it were not for the shock of that crowd pushing behind him 
at each new violence he had been stupefied by the course of the events for he had neither foreseen nor desired any of them could he anticipate for instance that his followers in the settlement would one day stone him these infuriated people lied when they accused him of having promised them an existence all fodder and laziness and in this justification in this reasoning in which he had tried to fight against his remorse was hidden the anxiety that he had not risen to the height of his task it was the doubt of the half-cultured man still perplexing him but he felt himself at the end of his courage he was no longer at heart with his mates he feared this enormous mass of the people blind and irresistible moving like a force of nature sweeping away everything outside rules and theories a certain repugnance was detaching him from them the discomfort of his new tastes the slow movement of all his being towards a superior class at this moment rasseneur's voice was lost in the midst of enthusiastic shouts hurrah for rasseneur he's the fellow bravo bravo the innkeeper shut the door while the band dispersed and the two men looked at each other in silence they both shrugged their shoulders they finished up by having a drink together on the same day there was a great dinner at piolaine they were celebrating the betrothal of negrel and cecile since the previous evening the grégoires had had the dining-room waxed and the drawing-room dusted melanie reigned in the kitchen watching over the roasts and stirring the sauces the odor of which ascended to the attics it had been decided that francis the coachman should help honorine to wait the gardener's wife would wash up and the gardener would open the gate never had the substantial patriarchal old house been in such a state of gaiety everything went off beautifully madame hennebeau was charming with cecile and she smiled at negrel when the Mosseau lawyer gallantly proposed the health of the future household m hennebeau was also very amiable his smiling face struck the guests the report circulated that he was rising in favour with the directors and that he would soon be made an officer of the legion of honour on account of the energetic manner in which he had put down the strike nothing was said about recent events but there was an air of triumph in the general joy and the dinner became the official celebration of a victory at last then they were saved and once more they could begin to eat and sleep in peace a discreet allusion was made to those dead whose blood the voreux mud had yet scarcely drunk up it was a necessary lesson and they were all affected when the grégoires added that it was now the duty of all to go and heal the wounds in the settlements they had regained their benevolent placidity excusing their brave miners whom they could already see again at the bottom of the mines giving a good example of everlasting resignation the Monceau notables who had now left off trembling agreed that this question of the wage system ought to be studied cautiously the roasts came on and the victory became complete when m hennebeau read a letter from the bishop announcing abbe ranvier's removal the middle class throughout the province had been roused to anger by the story of this priest who treated the soldiers as murderers and when the dessert appeared the lawyer resolutely declared that he was a free thinker deneulin was there with his two daughters in the midst of the joy he forced himself to hide the melancholy of his ruin that very morning he had signed the sale of his vandame concession to the Monceau company with the night at his throat he had submitted to the directors demands at last giving up to them that prey that had been on the watch for so long scarcely obtaining from them the money necessary to pay off his creditors he had even accepted as a lucky chance at the last moment their offer to keep him as divisional engineer thus resigning himself to watch as a simple salaried servant over that pit which had swallowed up his fortune it was the knell of small personal enterprises the approaching disappearance of the masters eaten up one by one by the ever-hungry ogre of capital drowned in the rising flood of great companies he alone paid the expenses of the strike 
he understood that they were drinking to his disaster when they drank to monsieur hennebeau's rosette and he only consoled himself a little when he saw the fine courage of lucy and jean who looked charming in their dun-up toilettes laughing at the downfall like happy tomboys disdainful of money when they passed into the drawing-room for coffee m gregoire drew his cousin aside and congratulated him on the courage of his decision what would you have your real mistake was to risk the million of your monceau denier over van damme you gave yourself a terrible wound and it has melted away in that dog's labour while mine which was not stirred from my drawer still keeps me comfortably doing nothing as it will keep my grandchildren's children End of section thirty five section thirty six of german on by emile zola translation by havelock ellis this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by map part seven chapter two on sunday etienne escaped from the settlement at nightfall a very clear sky sprinkled with stars lit up the earth with a blue haze of twilight he went down towards the canal and followed the bank slowly in the direction of marsh Inn. it was his favourite walk a grass-covered path two leagues long passing straight beside this geometrical waterway which unrolled itself like an endless ingot of molten silver he never met any one there but on this day he was vexed to see a man come up to him beneath the pale starlight the two solitary walkers only recognized each other when they were face to face what is it you said etienne souverain nodded his head without replying for a moment they remained motionless then side by side they set out towards marchiennes each of them seemed to be continuing his own reflections as though they were far away from each other have you seen in the paper about pluchart's success at paris asked etienne at length after that meeting at belleville they waited for him on the pavement and gave him an ovation oh he's afloat now in spite of his sore throat he can do what he likes in the future the engine man shrugged his shoulders he felt contempt for fine talkers fellows who go into politics as one goes to the bar to get an income out of phrases etienne was now studying darwin he had read fragments summarized and popularized in a five sou volume and out of this ill-understood reading he had gained for himself a revolutionary idea of the struggle for existence the lean eating the fat the strong people devouring the pallid middle class but souverain furiously attacked the stupidity of the socialists who accept darwin that apostle of scientific inequality whose famous selection was only good for aristocratic philosophers his mate persisted however wishing to reason out the matter and expressing his doubts by an hypothesis supposing the old society were no longer to exist swept away to the crumbs well was it not to be feared that the new world would grow up again slowly spoilt by the same injustices some sick and others flourishing some more skilful and intelligent fattening on everything and others imbecile and lazy becoming slaves again but before this vision of eternal wretchedness the engine man shouted out fiercely that if justice was not possible with man then man must disappear for every rotten society there must be a massacre until the last creature was exterminated and there was silence again for a long time the sunken head souverain walked over the short grass so absorbed that he kept to the extreme edge by the water with the quiet certainty of a sleepwalker on a roof then he shuddered causelessly as though he had stumbled against a shadow his eyes lifted and his face was very pale he said softly to his companion did i ever tell you how she died whom do you mean my wife over there in russia etienne made a vague gesture astonished at the tremor in his voice and at the sudden desire for confidence in this lad who was usually so impassive in his stoical detachment from others 
and from himself he only knew that the woman was his mistress and that she had been hanged in moscow the affair hadn't gone off so durant said with eyes still vacantly following the white stream of the canal between the bluish colonnades of tall trees we had been a fortnight at the bottom of a hole undermining the railway and it was not the imperial train that was blown up it was a passenger train then they arrested anotchka she brought us bread every evening disguised as a peasant woman she lit the fuse too because a man might have attracted attention i followed the trial hidden in the crowd for six days his voice became thick and he coughed as though he were choking twice i wanted to cry out and to rush over the people's heads to join her but what was the good one man less would be one soldier less and i could see that she was telling me not to come when her large eyes met mine he coughed again on the last day in the square i was there it was raining they stupidly lost their heads put out by the falling rain it took twenty minutes to hang the other four the cord broke they could not finish the fourth Anochka was standing up waiting she could not see me she was looking for me in the crowd i got on to a post and she saw me and our eyes never turned from each other when she was dead she was still looking at me i waved my hat i came away there was silence again the white road of the canal unrolled to the far distance and they both walked with the same quiet step as though each had fallen back into his isolation at the horizon the pale water seemed to open the sky with a little hole of light it was our punishment souverain went on roughly we were guilty to love each other yes it is well that she is dead heroes will be born from her blood and i no longer have any cowardice at my heart ah nothing neither parents nor wife nor friend nothing to make my hand tremble on the day when i must take others lives or give up my own etienne had stopped shuddering in the cool night he discussed no more he simply said we have gone far shall we go back they went back towards the bureau slowly and he added after a few paces have you seen the new placards the company had that morning put up some more large yellow posters they were clearer and more conciliatory and the company undertook to take back the certificates of those miners who went down on the following day everything would be forgotten and pardon was offered even to those who were most implicated yes i've seen replied the engine man well what do you think of it i think that it's all up the flock will go down again you are all too cowardly etienne feverishly excused his mates a man may be brave a mob which is dying of hunger has no strength step by step they were returning to the bureau and before the black mass of the pit he continued swearing that he at least would never go down but he could forgive those who did then as the rumour ran that the carpenters had not had time to repair the tubbing he asked for information was it true had the weight of the soil against the timber which formed the internal skirt of scaffolding to the shaft so pushed it in that the winding cages rubbed as they went down for a length of over fifty metres souverain who once more became uncommunicative replied briefly he had been working the day before and the cage did in fact jar the engineman had even had to double the speed to pass that spot but all the bosses received any observations with the same irritating remark if it was coal they wanted that could be repaired later on you see that will smash up etienne murmured it will be a fine time with eyes vaguely fixed on the pit in the shadow souverain quietly concluded if it does smash up the mates will know it since you advise them to go down again nine o'clock struck at the Monceau steeple and his companion having said that he was going to bed he added without putting out his hand well good-bye i'm going away what you're going away yes i've asked for my certificate back i'm going elsewhere etienne stupefied and affected looked at him after walking for two hours he said that to him and in so calm a voice while the mere announcement of this sudden separation made his whole heart ache 
they had got to know each other they had toiled together that always makes one sad the idea of not seeing a person again you're going away and where do you go over there i don't know at all but i shall see you again no i think not they were silent and remained for a moment facing each other without finding anything to say then good-bye good-bye while etienne ascended toward the settlement souverine turned and again went along the canal bank and there now alone he continued to walk with sunken head so lost in the darkness that he seemed merely a moving shadow of the night now and then he stopped he counted the hours that struck afar when he heard midnight strike he left the bank and turned towards the Voreux. at that time the pit was empty and he only met a sleepy-eyed captain it was not until two o'clock that they would begin to get up steam to resume work first he went to take from a cupboard a jacket which he pretended to have forgotten various tools a drill armed with its screw a small but very strong saw a hammer and a chisel were rolled up in this jacket then he left but instead of going out through the shed he passed through the narrow corridor which led to the ladder passage with his jacket under his arm he quietly went down without a lamp measuring the depth by counting the ladders he knew that the cage jarred at three hundred and seventy four metres against the fifth row of the lower tubbing when he had counted fifty four ladders he put out his hand and was able to feel the swelling of the planking it was there then with the skill and coolness of a good workman who has been reflecting over his task for a long time he set to work he began by sawing a panel in the brattice so as to communicate with the winding shaft with the help of matches quickly lighted and blown out he was then able to ascertain the condition of the tubbing and of the recent repairs between calais and valenciennes the sinking of mine shafts was surrounded by immense difficulties on account of the masses of subterranean water in great sheets at the level of the lowest valleys only the construction of tubbings frameworks jointed like the stays of a barrel could keep out the springs which flow in and isolate the shafts in the midst of the lakes which with deep obscure waves beat against the walls it had been necessary in sinking the bureau to establish two tubbings that of the upper level in the shifting sands and white clays bordering the chalky stratum and fissured in every part swollen with water like a sponge then that of the lower level immediately above the coal stratum in a yellow sand as fine as flour flowing with liquid fluidity it was here that the torrent was to be found that subterranean sea so dreaded in the coal pits of the nord a sea with its storms and its shipwrecks an unknown and unfathomable sea rolling its dark floods more than three hundred metres beneath the daylight usually the tubbings resisted the enormous pressure the only thing to be dreaded was the piling up of the neighbouring soil shaken by the constant movement of the old galleries which were filling up in this descent of the rocks lines of fracture were sometimes produced which slowly extended as far as the scaffolding at last perforating it and pushing it into the shaft and there was the great danger of a landslip and a flood filling the pit with an avalanche of earth and a deluge of springs souverain sitting astride in the opening he had made discovered a very serious defect in the fifth row of tubbing the wood was bellied out from the framework several planks had even come out of their shoulder pieces abundant filtrations pichot the miners call them were jetting out of the joints through the tarred oaken with which they were caulked the carpenters pressed for time had been content to place iron squares at the angles so carelessly that not all the screws were put in a considerable movement was evidently going on behind in the sand of the torrent then with his wimble he unscrewed the squares so that another push would tear them all off it was a foolhardy task during which he frequently only just escaped from falling headlong down the hundred and eighty metres which separated him from the bottom he had been obliged to seize the oak guides 
the joists along which the cages slid and suspended over the void he traversed the length of the cross-beams with which they were joined from point to point slipping along sitting down turning over simply buttressing himself on an elbow or a knee with tranquil contempt of death a breath would have sent him over and three times he caught himself up without a shudder first he felt with his hand and then worked only lighting a match when he lost himself in the midst of these slimy beams after loosening the screws he attacked the wood itself and the peril became still greater he had sought for the key the piece which held the others he attacked it furiously making holes in it sawing it thinning it so that it lost its resistance while through the holes and the cracks the water which escaped in small jets blinded him and soaked him in icy rain two matches were extinguished they all became damp and then there was night the bottomless depth of darkness from this moment he was seized by rage the breath of the invisible intoxicated him the black horror of this rain-beaten hole urged him to mad destruction he wreaked his fury at random against the tubbing striking where he could with his wimble with his saw seized by the desire to bring the whole thing at once down on his head he brought as much ferocity to the task as though he had been digging a knife into the skin of some execrated living creature who would kill the voreux at last that evil beast with ever open jaws which had swallowed so much human flesh the bite of his tools could be heard his spine lengthened he crawled climbed down then up again holding on by a miracle in continual movement the flight of a nocturnal bird amid the scaffolding of a belfry but he grew calm dissatisfied with himself why could not things be done coolly without haste he took breath and then went back into the ladder passage stopping up the hole by replacing the panel which he had sawn that was enough he did not wish to raise the alarm by excessive damage which would have been repaired immediately the beast was wounded in the belly we should see if it was still alive at night and he had left his mark the frightened world would know that the beast had not died a natural death he took his time in methodically rolling up his tools in his jacket and slowly climbed up the ladders then when he had emerged from the pit without being seen it did not even occur to him to go and change his clothes three o'clock struck he remained standing on the road waiting at the same hour etienne who was not asleep was disturbed by a slight sound in the thick night of the room he distinguished the low breath of the children and the snoring of bon mort and Mehu, while jeanlin near him was breathing with a prolonged flute-like whistle no doubt he had dreamed and he was turning back when the noise began again it was the creaking of a palliasse the stifled effort of someone who was getting up then he imagined that catherine must be ill i say is it you what is the matter he asked in a low voice no one replied and the snoring of the others continued for five minutes nothing stirred then there was fresh creaking feeling certain this time that he was not mistaken he crossed the room putting his hands out into the darkness to feel the opposite bed he was surprised to find the young girl sitting up holding in her breath awake and on the watch well why don't you reply what are you doing then at last she said i'm getting up getting up at this hour yes i'm going back to work at the pit etienne felt deeply moved and sat down on the edge of the pelleas while catherine explained her reasons to him she suffered too much by living thus in idleness feeling continual looks of reproach weighing on her she would rather run the risk of being knocked about down there by cheval and if her mother refused to take her money when she brought it well she was big enough to act for herself and make her own soup go away i want to dress and don't say anything will you if you want to be kind but he remained near her he had put his arms round her waist in a caress of grief and pity pressed one against the other in their shirts they could feel the warmth of each other's naked flesh at the edge of this bed still moist with the night's sleep 
she had at first tried to free herself then she began to cry quietly in her turn taking him by the neck to press him against her in a despairing clasp and they remained without any further desires with the past of their unfortunate love which they had not been able to satisfy was it then done with forever would they never dare to love each other some day now that they were free it only needed a little happiness to dissipate their shame that awkwardness which prevented them from coming together because of all sorts of ideas which they themselves could not read clearly go to bed again she whispered i don't want to light up it would wake mother it is time leave me he could not hear he was pressing her wildly with a heart drowned in immense sadness the need for peace an irresistible need for happiness was carrying him away and he saw himself married in a neat little house with no other ambition than to live and to die there both of them together he would be satisfied with bread and if there were only enough for one she should have it what was the good of anything else was there anything in life worth more but she was unfolding her naked arms please leave me then in a sudden impulse he said in her ear wait i'm coming with you and he was himself surprised at what he had said he had sworn never to go down again whence then came this sudden decision arising from his lips without thought of his without even a moment's discussion there was now such calm within him so complete a cure of his doubts that he persisted like a man saved by chance who has at last found the only harbour from his torment so he refused to listen to her when she became alarmed understanding that he was devoting himself for her and fearing the ill words which would greet him at the pit he laughed at everything the placards promised pardon and that was enough i want to work that's my idea let us dress and make no noise they dressed themselves in the darkness with a thousand precautions she had secretly prepared her miner's clothes the evening before he took a jacket and breeches from the cupboard and they did not wash themselves for fear of knocking the bowl all were asleep but they had to cross the narrow passage where the mother slept when they started as ill luck would have it they stumbled against a chair she woke and asked drowsily eh what is it catherine had stopped trembling and violently pressing etienne's hand it's me don't trouble yourself he said i feel stifled and am going outside to breathe a bit very well and Mahid fell asleep again catherine dared not stir at last she went down into the parlour and divided a slice of bread and butter which she had reserved from a loaf given by a monceau lady then they softly closed the door and went away souverine had remained standing near the advantage at the corner of the road for half an hour he had been looking at the colliers who were returning to work in the darkness passing by with the dull tramp of a herd he was counting them as a butcher counts his beasts at the entrance to the slaughter-house and he was surprised at their number even his pessimism had not foreseen that the number of cowards would have been so great the stream continued to pass by and he grew stiff very cold with clenched teeth and bright eyes but he started among the men passing by whose faces he could not distinguish he had just recognized one by his walk he came forward and stopped him where are you going to etienne in surprise instead of replying stammered what you've not set out yet then he confessed he was going back to the pit no doubt he had sworn only it could not be called life to wait with folded arms for things which would perhaps happen in a hundred years and besides reasons of his own had decided him souverain had listened to him shuddering he seized him by the shoulder and pushed him towards the settlement go home again i want you to do you understand but catherine having approached he recognized her also at the end protested declaring that he allowed no one to judge his conduct and the engine man's eyes went from the young girl to her companion while he stepped back with a sudden relinquishing movement when there was a woman in a man's heart 
that man was done for he might die perhaps he saw again in a rapid vision his mistress hanging over there at moscow that last link cut from his flesh which had rendered him free of the lives of others and of his own life he said simply go etienne feeling awkward was delaying and trying to find some friendly word so as not to separate in this manner then you're still going yes well give me your hand old chap a pleasant journey and no ill feeling the other stretched out an icy hand neither friend nor wife good-bye for good this time yes good-bye and souverain standing motionless in the darkness watched etienne and catherine entering the borough end of section thirty six